World War II comes and goes. During the war, there was some business to be had. We employed women. First time women worked in the workforce. Today you come and visit, uh, probably 50% of the guitar builders that we employ today are female. Um, war is over, soldiers come home. Women all quit. They went home to raise a family. Soldiers come home and business picks up. The economy gets better. Music becomes more important. Different types of music become more popular. And the Martin guitar is right in the middle of what's going on in terms of American and also British music, folk, uh, country, blues, rock and roll. Um, so the next couple of display cases are going to be dedicated to commemorating our relationship with music post-World War II right up until the late 1970s, uh, early 1980s. Elvis Presley, as a young man, played a Martin guitar. Uh, my grandfather and his brother grew up in Nazareth. Um, his brother actually was going to join the business. My grandfather wasn't sure. And uh, unfortunately, in his late 20s, his brother, Herbert, passed away. And so his father tapped him on the shoulder and said, I really need your help. I'd like you to come join the family business, which he did. And he shepherded it marvelously uh, for many, many, many years and then mentored his son and was a great mentor to me. Uh, not having grown up in the business, I was fortunate later in my teen life and then through college and, and, and after college while he was still alive, spent a lot of time with him, actually lived with him for a while, and it was a, a really profound um, experience to hear from him what it meant to be a Martin and to shepherd this fantastic heritage through a generation. So my father, I'm born, he joins the business. I guess he needed a job, pay for the kid. Um, and he catches the folk boom. And of course, uh, Inside Lewin Davis is out now. There's a great documentary about the folk era in Greenwich Village. So there's a lot of interest in you know, folk music again, which is really cool. And pretty quickly, folk music becomes pop music. And we can't keep up. We cannot make enough guitars to satisfy the demand from all of the people who want to play folk music. And that's why we're here. We outstripped the capacity of the old factory, bought this property, built the first part of this now very large facility, and began to catch up. And just as we get to catch up, folk music and rock and roll collide, and a whole nother generation of musicians embraces the flat top steel string acoustic guitar and uses it as a tool, tool to communicate some pretty significant information to a generation that is hungry for it. Um, some early attempts at electrifying flat top guitars. This was my first electric guitar. Again, there might be a picture of that in the book, I'm not sure. Um, in hindsight, uh, I kind of wish I'd asked for a strap, but what are you going to do? Huh? Okay, ah, here's, here's an interesting guitar. Pretty beat up, you know, it's been around, right? So it's uh, nicknamed Grandpa, and it was built in 1953, and it came to us um, after traveling around and the fellow we bought it from said, you deserve to have this guitar. And we said, well, yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's got some wear and tear on it. He said, yeah, well, let me tell you the story of this guitar from the point at which I know it. And this is not from 1953. This would probably be from the 80s, right? Yep. So this guitar at that point was the property of an itinerant folk musician, Mary Lou Lord. And Mary Lou had a boyfriend. And he was a pretty good musician, and he fell madly in love, not only with Mary Lou, but with the guitar. And he was the fellow that named it Grandpa. He said, this guitar just has a mojo that I, I just, man, I'm loving it. So he starts traveling around, becoming more and more and more famous, touring, doesn't always have the guitar with him, but periodically he does, periodically Mary Lou has it, and he meets another woman. And at some point he's got the guitar, and the other woman's there, and she said, where did you get that beat up old guitar? And he said, respect please, this beat up old guitar is grandpa, and it is a monster. And she said, well you didn't answer my question. Where did you get that guitar? And he said, oh I got that from my other girlfriend. She said, no, 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 no. You don't have another girlfriend. I'm your girlfriend. Get rid of it. And so reluctantly he gave it back to Mary Lou. And the reason we have it here is because this is the guitar that Kurt Cobain wanted to play on MTV Unplugged, but Courtney Love wouldn't let him. 
So he used something very similar from the same era. Fast forward now. Poor Kurt passes away way too young. Um, Courtney Love is on MTV Unplugged, playing with her band Hole, filmed live. We supply the guitars. I come to work on Monday morning. Everyone is livid. I said, I know. They said, I can't believe it. I said, it's OK. Stuff happens. No, no, no. This is terrible. Hey, stuff happens. We've got to fix it. I said, we're not touching that guitar. They said, really? I said, yeah. So what happens was Mary Lou, or uh, Courtney Loves on MTV Unplugged, having some sort of relationship with the guitar player. During the filming of MTV Unplugged, she decides to have a fight with him and smashes this guitar live on television so hard that the electronics fly out of the guitar. And that's the way we've kept the guitar ever since it was returned to us that Monday afternoon from that fateful weekend in New York City. This display is dedicated to artist models. These guitars were built in conjunction with a Martin artist. What we do is we form a partnership. They help to design the guitar. They get a guitar. They get the opportunity to buy a few guitars for their families and family and friends. We make a run of guitars. We sell through our authorized dealers. They ultimately find a home with a consumer. Often the consumer is wildly enamored with the top style of music played by the artist who helped design the guitar. Part of the proceeds of the sale of that run of guitars are then forwarded to a charity of the artist's choice. I also think this is an, a point now on the tour when a lot of our visitors begin to go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I grew up with that music. And I think when kids start to really get into the guitar, they start to get into the music and they want to know where did this music come from? Where did it come from? So maybe they'll pick up a magazine, an acoustic guitar or a guitar player, and they'll read an article interview with one of their guitar heroes, John Mayer. Oh, he's a guitar hero of mine. And at some point in the interview, John Mayer says, well, you know, I was profoundly influenced by Bob Dylan. So now this young budding guitar player says, hmm, I need to learn more about Bob Dylan. So now they go, thanks to the internet, back into the guitar player archives, and they find an early interview with Bob Dylan. And at some point in the interview, Bob Dylan says, I was profoundly influenced by a folk musician named Woody Guthrie. So now they go and they say, I need to learn more about this fellow named Woody Guthrie. And along the way, they find these iconic guitar heroes holding Martin guitars. What better endorsement than to find out that generations of your guitar hero loved Martin guitars? business was fantastic. My dad made a couple of acquisitions. He bought the Darko String Company from the Dodarios, which was a brilliant move because strings need to be replaced. He also bought in short order Vega Banjos, five, five drums, 11 guitars. We acquired the Goya brand. And unfortunately, all of the acquisitions except for Darko failed ultimately. And the acoustic guitar the popularity of it came to a rather abrupt hiatus, not a halt completely, but a downturn, a significant downturn, by the end of the late 1970s, early 1980s. And I say that part of it is that, you know, maybe it was just time. You know, musicians, the audience are fickle. They wanted to hear something new. Um, it wasn't just acoustic guitars. It was electric guitars. There was an instrument that was evolving the culmination of which at that point in time was a product called the Yamaha DX7, a digital sampling keyboard. And if you remember back then, if you went out, say you went to the lounge at the Holiday Inn where there used to be a combo, there used to be a guitar player and a bass player and a drummer and someone on keyboards, there was someone on keyboards with a rack of keyboards. And he was able to mimic the sound that you could have experienced from a live combo band. And disco disco, which was no good for anyone who made live music because it didn't involve live music. So the audience now is distracted and for whatever reason, players moved away temporarily from the acoustic guitar. In fact, people were beginning to say it's the end. 
it's the end of the guitar, that it's, it's going to become, it's going to go the way of, I don't know, the accordion. Um, very difficult time for us as a company. Um, we had to close the acquisitions that failed. The core business uh, dropped off dramatically. We had a lot of debt. And then just to put it into perspective, the peak during this era was mid 20,000s in terms of volume per year. Um, we dropped off to the point where we struggled one year to make 3,000 at a time.